I'm here with Caleb Maupin, the author of Bread Turbs, Bread Tube Serves Imperialism, how YouTubers are serving imperialism. We'll talk to him about that in a second. But first, I want to play this from a uh, UK soldier. A uh, former NATO s soldier destroys the official Ukraine war narrative, uh, the official Western Ukraine nor war narrative. And who is this guy? Uh, his name is, well, I got to read it this way. His name is Joe Glenton, and he was a British soldier serving in the UK, Africa, and Afghanistan. He refused a second tour on legal and moral grounds and served five months in a military prison. He has written for The Independent, The Guardian, New Internationalist, and Military History Monthly, his first book, Soldier in a Box, his album. So here's what he has to say about what's happening in Ukraine. I'm not a stranger to war. I served in Afghanistan, which was itself a particularly brutal conflict, but it is like a bar fight compared to what can happen if the nuclear powers escalate the war, which is currently playing out in Ukraine. It feels like the most dangerous situation in my lifetime, a nuclear threat, a threat to everybody is very apparent. It feels like we're teetering on the edge of that. And yet we have people who seem to be viewing it as a kind of football match, who are painting their faces and cheerleading, where all kinds of particularly war horny takes have been emerging about you no know, fly zones, about different forms of intervention. It would be a cinch, Dawn, to take them out. You send in the RAF, it would take them an hour and a half. War is appealing for some journalists, particularly the journalists who haven't experienced it, because with war can go a particular boost to your career, a higher level of attention, more Twitter followers, more likes on Twitter. And I think that is a bad metric by which to measure the, the, the need for war. I can remember people talking about Donald Trump, how he could start a nuclear war on Twitter. Many of those same people of the blue tick species are using the platform to lobby for a no-fly zone that could lead to nuclear war. The kind of people who would formulate themselves as the grown-ups in the room are treating the risk of nuclear war as if it is just a kind of tit for tat in Westminster or in Washington DC. This is not just Labour source says, this is not just handbags in the House of Commons. This is not that. This is bigger. Nuclear war doesn't mean anything good for the world. You could survive potentially, but you wouldn't want to. We actually had some training about this when I was in the army. We have to get togged up in our NBC, nuclear biological chemical warfare suits with respirators and we'd be made to run up and down and occasionally we'd be CS gassed and we'd be told how to survive a nuclear apocalypse. The slogan was used in the videos, which were all from the 80s, was survive to fight. So you survive the nuclear apocalypse, the positive blast wave comes and you all lay down, assuming you see it coming, and then you stay down for a bit because then the negative blast wave comes back and that passes over you, and then you are alive to fight. And all I could think about during these training processes was fight over what? Fight over the mutant wastelands? Become fucking Mad Max and cut around in your Nissan Micra or a Ford Escort with a gun on top? What is there left? That's the notion of mutually assured destruction, that everybody is destroyed. I mean, that's the underpinning thing. Everybody dies. The problem with Twitter and Twitter war hysteria and all the social media stuff guides you towards just rapid, urgent reaction. It's very often a kind of appeal to emotion that something must be done instantly. And clearly things need to be done because people are dying in Ukraine. But I do think we need to be cautious. We need to be exercising reason rather than emotion. I understand why there are a set of people who are kind of like, let's bomb the 40 mile convoy. I understand why that is an appealing idea that we can just go and stop that happening. But we need to steer away from the immediate emotional payoff and be reasoned. Doing that is an act of war on top of the war that's already going. And it would potentially escalate this. It would bring into conflict one nuclear power with another nuclear power. And there is a bigger picture, the biggest picture of all, which we have to consider here. I think we have to look past this seductive thing to kind of look to NATO or look to Russia and try and find on the NATO side a kind of liberal democratic values or on the Russian side anti-imperialist or anti-fascist thing. I think we have to look for another narrative which doesn't internalize NATO good or Russia good. I have to have a much more sophisticated analysis of what's going on here. I have no illusions as some centrist commentators do that NATO is kind of wooferendum or FBPE with guns and missiles. That is not what it is. NATO's interest is stability in the sense that it's stability for Western capitalism. The Bosses Club of Wealthy Nations, who are the original founder members, and then increasingly it's other countries who've sought NATO memberships. I have a dubious... So I, I just want to reiterate that point before I, we move on, is that he said, you know, NATO isn't there to defend anybody. It's there to defend Western capitalism. That's exactly what it's, that's what's happening. Okay. Uh, of having a NATO medal, it's a little thing with a blue ribbon, and it says in English and French, in the service of peace and freedom. And that always jumped out at me because I left it with my little cousin uh, with my granddad's medal, which is a Great War medal, which says the war to end all wars. And in both cases, um, that's not very accurate. My experience of NATO is in Afghanistan. I was involved in the early stages of the NATO mission in Afghanistan. I understand and recognize NATO's part in bringing about huge amounts of violence in Afghanistan against Afghan people. I have comrades, particularly who served in the Royal Air Force, who were in Italy attaching bombs to the fighters, which would fly over and bomb Libya and destroy Libya. You can see the results in both those countries of NATO's mission. I suppose I find myself in a weird position where I'm not a fan of NATO and of Putin's regime. I don't see the need to pick between these two poles. While all, everyone's posturing and virtue signaling and doing their hot takes on Twitter, the people 
who are dying here are working class Russian conscripts and members of the Ukrainian military and Ukrainian civilians. That's the tragedy in all this. There's an element almost of smugness, like Brits and Americans, of all the people on the planet, Brits and Americans are kind of smugly looking on, going, oh, he's going to get bogged down. He's going to get bogged down in the country, get caught up in insurgency with people who don't want him. It's like, why are you laughing about this? You've literally just done this. The Kabul airlift was last year, so 20 years, when you got booted out. And historically, this has happened all over the world. So I'm not sure why you're being so smug about it. Condoleezza Rice was asked, if you invade a sovereign country, it's a war crime. When you invade a sovereign nation, that is a war crime. <laughs> I mean, I think we're at, at, at just a real basic, basic point there. Well, I and so, uh, and so that's crazily ironic because Condoleezza Rice participated in an invasion of a sovereign country called Iraq. Okay. I, I, it is certainly against every principle of international law and international order. You've done all those things yourself and never been held accountable. And yet you can just go on TV and say that. Like the level of just sheer neck to do that. I guess part of it is how these people have been reconditioned. We kind of saw it with George Bush where now he's a harmless old man who just paints a bit rather than a war criminal. I find myself in a strange position of, of liking something before it was cool, being anti-war. And now all of a sudden loads of people who've never uttered a word about Yemen or Palestine or Afghanistan are invoking like Tony Benn type speeches. Responsibility we have too for our fellow citizens and for the human race wherever the war takes place and now we're on the eve of nuclear warfare and that would be the end of the human race it could be a kind of entry point for people to question wars more generally because the things which are happening in ukraine now were done in iraq in some cases worse things over a much longer period i mean we're six seven days into this illegal invasion by a foreign power and that is what happened in iraq we had a weird spectacle of some very mainstream media channels almost celebrating but how do you make a Molotov cocktail in five easy steps. Really glad you're able to join us because we want to show you something uh, that's pretty extraordinary, actually. They've sort of grated the styrofoam and they're now putting it into the bottles. The styrofoam works to make the Molotov cocktail sticky, to help it stick to vehicles, to other targets as well. You can see them grating it. It's really quite extraordinary. I have friends who are from Derry in Northern Ireland and they're doing that kind of, you know, that kind of monkey meme where it's awkward. Like people who live through British occupation, who would be out throwing Molotov cocktails and rocks at occupying troops who are like, oh, this is cool now. And I think you could take that lesson and extrapolate it and you could look at Palestine, you could look at people resisting occupation in Afghanistan and Iraq. And a lot of those people are like, what? This is Why was it not okay where we did it? And I think that it's a fair point to make. Like, why is it that now it's celebrated in what are news pieces? Why it's suddenly tolerable, even good and moral to do that? I really agree with the solidarity that people are showing Ukraine. So I approve of them kicking Russian teams out of Champions League. I'm kind of down with a lot of the sanctions and stuff, but I can't help but question where that was for Iraq, where that is for Yemen, where that is for Palestine. There's something we really need to stop and, and look at there about why these degrees of solidarity and sanction are being applied to, applied to Russia. And they never tried to do that with Tony Blair and George Bush in the Iraq war. And I think we have to have a little bit of self-reflection about why that is. Wow. So let me bring in Caleb uh, Maupin. Wow. Um, would you like to comment on what you just heard? Sure. Well, this this kind of voice is so important right now because there are so many people within the military of the United States, of Britain, who are asking themselves, what happens if this escalates? Um, and, you know, there was a lot of support for Ron Paul in the military. Tulsi Gabbard comes out of the military. And I mean, this should be common sense. I mean, if you go back to the 80s, every time there was some kind of incident with the Soviet Union. Yeah, you had the right wing. The Republicans would beat the drum and, and hate hate. Russia. But then you had voices like he highlighted on there, like Tony Benn, uh, like Bella Abzug in, in New York, who would get on there and say, now, we don't want to have a nuclear war. What, what does war you know, with Russia actually mean? Uh, and, and there was a voice of reason saying, you know, nuclear war kind of ends the human race, or at least two thirds of it. Uh, maybe that's not a good idea. We don't have that now. Um, and so voices like this, I mean, this guy is saying what should be common sense really, which is that, you know, war is pretty ugly and awful, and maybe we shouldn't have a media that cheerleads it. Uh, I'm glad I'm glad you showed that video because people need to hear these kind of voices. Um, and there's a guy who went to the he, he he was in the battlefield. He saw the ridiculous destruction uh, that we were committing illegally and he wouldn't participate anymore with it. So they put him in jail. I thought that's the kind of shit Putin would do if you wouldn't go fight in a war and put you in jail. No, that's what the West does. Uh, so I'm glad I got to show that to you. I hope people pass it around and I hope it uh, was uh, worthwhile and I hope it helped educate people as to what's really happening from a real soldier who's actually on the ground and saw it and not a pretend, uh, not a CNN reporter <laughs> who sniffs a gas, a backpack and tells you there's been a chemical attack. Um, all right. Uh, Anything else you want to say about that, Caleb, before we move on? 
Well, no, I just, uh, I just, you know, again, if you care about the Ukrainian people, why would you want to prolong this conflict? Uh, and he's, he's right about how the, the kind of hijacking of left aesthetics, right? You know, we've been told the Palestinians, when they throw Molotov cocktails, that they are, they are terrorists. Uh, but now U U.S. media is cheering for a war and they're kind of trying to use the, the aesthetics that one might associate with, with a national liberation struggle in the developing world to sell it, to make it romantic for CNN and MSNBC. And that's particularly vulgar. And it shows, again, how they are manipulating people's better instincts to serve empire. <laughs> Hey, we're doing our live stand-up tour. We're going to be in Orlando. We're going to be in Tampa, Columbus, Cleveland, Pittsburgh, much, much more. Go to jimmydorkcomedy.com for a link for all the tickets. And you can come see our shows in Los Angeles, too. We do one weekly. Go to jimmydorkcomedy.com and become a premium member while you're there. Get all the extra content. Thank you.